Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chairman of Endeavor Global, Edgar Bronfman, Jr. Good evening, everyone. I, I just, first of all, thank you all for being here. I, I just want you to know how relieved I am right now. I don't know if any of you noticed, but I noticed immediately that when Brian was up and speaking, uh, he had a piece of tape on his, <laughs> on his cheek uh, that was keeping the mic close to his mouth. And I'm thinking, if they that, do that to me, I'm going to rip half my beard off, and it's going to be very painful. And they just told me that I didn't have to wear the tape. So there's a real sense of relief. Um, so I, I, I want to tell a quick story about my, my wife's not here tonight. Uh, but I remember being at a, um, uh, at a fundraiser uh, for an organization where, where she's involved. And the mayor of New York, uh, Bill de Blasio, was speaking. <laughs> and he said, you know, he was very happy to be there, very happy to support this organization, et cetera. It was, it was a thrill for him to be in this new building, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, but you know what? I'm really, really envious of my wife because tonight she's in Florence, Italy. And I thought, really? I mean, you're the mayor of New York. You shouldn't really be jealous of your wife being in some other town. Well, my wife tonight is in Torino, Italy. So. <laughs> Nobody can be jealous of that. I don't know how many people have been to Torino, but anyway, <laughs> clearly not enough to get a laugh. Uh, but I, I do have my, my, my son, my daughter, and my soon-to-be son-in-law here, so maybe they could stand up and uh, take a bow. I also really am just here to say, I want to say thank you, not only to everyone who's come here from all the way around the world, uh, but I really want to say thank you to the Endeavor staff all around the world. We're 380 people strong. Um, all the people at Endeavor Global, and I particularly want to thank Alana Chin, who put this night together, and I want to say thank you. Um, and, and now uh, I'm going to introduce tonight's honoree. I, I don't really think he needs much of an introduction, but as you know, he was co-founder of America Online, which came to be known as AOL. He is the chairman and CEO of Revolution LLC and the chairman of the Case Foundation. Um, and so many, more, so many things more than that. But having known Steve a little bit, I, I would say to you that if I were to describe him, I, I would say that he's particularly brilliant, thoughtfully outspoken, and thoroughly decent, which I think is a pretty spectacular combination. So with that, may I bring on stage Mr. Steve Case. Thank you, Edgar. So we're going to try and make this fun. I thought about starting it off with, like, challenging you into an arm wrestling match or something like that, but obviously not a lot of people arm wrestle here either. <laughs> um, but actually, I, I wanted to start because I'm, I'm really curious and, and mean no, uh, I, I don't mean the, uh, to, to ask too much about the his, historical allegory, but I'm just curious what you think about the ATT <laughs> Time Warner merger. I just. I just couldn't help myself. I know you couldn't. <laughs> no, I think, uh, first of all, it's great to be here. And I, I, I'm honored to be honored, but I'm really here to honor Endeavor and all the great work that Edgar and Linda and Peter have done. Uh, Thank you, Steve. For 19 years, really celebrating entrepreneurship all around the world now, all across the, you know, the country, and really lifting up the next generation of, of entrepreneurs in the process also lifting up these communities, indeed, these, these, these countries. So it's, it's a great, uh, great to see all the progress. I've, I've, I've known Endeavor for a number of years, and the momentum keeps building. And we're delighted, uh, Gene and I, to be here tonight to really celebrate and honor uh, Endeavor. In terms of uh, your, your question, 
we, I learned the hard way 16 years ago when AOL and Time Warner you know, combined uh, that vision without execution is hallucination. <laughs> That's a quote from Thomas Edison more than a century ago. And, and you know, having an idea, having a vision, all the entrepreneurs in the room know this, having that, that sense of what's possible uh, and the optimism about what might be possible is obviously important, the vision thing, if you will. Uh, but ultimately, it comes down to execution. Ultimately, execution is about people and about having the right people focused on the right priorities, working together in the right way. We did not get that right with, with, with the merger with AOL and Time Warner if, if, if this uh, merger goes, goes through. Hopefully, they will get there. I think they've, a lot of people have learned lessons over the years in terms of how to think about managing uh, mergers and acquisitions. You've obviously been involved in a number, a number of yourselves. Yeah, and one of them wasn't that dissimilar to AOL, uh, Time Warner, and didn't end up much better than, than right. yours. So I've <laughs> been there, done that as well. Uh, but, but I am, so obviously more people are aware of that <laughs> than ever went to Torino. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, just to stay on, on, on the show, I'm just curious, though, as you think about the dichotomy between content and distribution, right? I mean, one of the things that seems hard is distribution wants exclusivity and content wants ubiquity, right? And, and, and that, that's a tough thing to manage no matter how great the team is and how, how good the execution is. And as I live in the media world, I, I haven't really squared that that circles somehow in my own mind, but I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I think that. there are advantages uh, strategically, at least hypothetically, to have more assets under, under one roof, and you've seen the you know, benefits of that with, with, with companies that have been able to do things in a more kind of integrated way across all those different channels. But yeah, my, my view for now 30 years, we started, well, 31 years ago, uh, was that while content was important uh, and uh, connectivity uh, obviously is important, at the, at the core, the killer app, if you will, is really the connect, connectivity that brings people together, the context that's part of that, and how do you kind of you know, create that context and community. So content is important, but context is more important. And you've seen the creation of many brands in the last you know, decade, you know, Netflix and others, that really are in the context business, right. uh, first and foremost. Fair enough. So one of the things that people may not generally know is that you do these sort of across the U.S. Uh, tours of called the Rise of the, of the Rest. Uh, and I think you've just finished your fifth right. one. So since we're talking about the expansion of Endeavor in the U.S., uh, and you know, we're obviously making some progress, but I'm just curious, A, what were your observations as you went around this time? Is anything different than the times before? And also, if you were advising Endeavor as to where we ought to be thinking about next, any places come to mind? No, I'm very, you know, I have great respect, as I said, for Endeavor's work for 19 years, mostly around the world, and how do you build on what's essentially the, we've seen in the last half century, the globalization of capital and the globalization of manufacturing. Now we're seeing the globalization of entrepreneurship. And so re recognizing that that's globalizing, I think, is important, and figuring out ways to create the right ecosystems, the right communities all around the, 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 the world, very important. But it's also important, which is why I applaud the, the work Endeavor is doing, to also focus in the United States and try to help communities all around the country rise up as well. And, and we have work to do, to be honest. That last year, 78% last year, of venture capital went to three states in this country, California, New York, and Massachusetts, 78%. The other 47 states fought over 22%. Uh, and so it does, and I don't think that it all reflects the distribution of great entrepreneurs with great ideas. It's more of a historical anomaly and frankly, kind of a little bit of laziness in terms of investors who are kind of focused on you know, investing in companies they can drive to as opposed to companies they can fly to. And so how do you level the playing field so every entrepreneur everywhere in this country has a shot at the American dream? Uh, and as in the process, you can really lift up these different, uh, different uh, communities. We also have work to do, and I know Endeavor is working hard on this, on leveling the playing field, not just in terms of place, but also in terms of people. Right. We launched an initiative at the Case Foundation recently called Faces of the Founders, hashtag Faces of the Founders, to try to create a more inclusive, diverse perspective on entrepreneurs. Last year, only 10% of venture capital in this country went to women. Over 90% went to men and people, overwhelmingly people of color are, are kind of left out as well. So how do you create this platform so everybody has that shot, whether it be in Detroit or Des Moines or in you know, Lagos or other parts of, of the world? We think that's very important. So that we tried to put that into action with these Rise of the Rest you know, bus tours, which we started you know, two and a half years ago. The first city, interestingly, because it's an Endeavor city we went to, was Detroit. 
Uh, and we did it. Hey, thank you, Detroit. And we actually did it deliberately because it was a signal. Uh, what happens if you get entrepreneurship right, you get innovation right, anything is possible. If you don't get that right, you know, things really you know, falter. And the folks from Detroit know that 75 years ago, Detroit was essentially Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. It was the most innovative city at its time because the car was the in most innovative technology of its time. It was growing like crazy and then lost 60% of its population and went bankrupt in part because it lost its entrepreneurial mojo. Meanwhile, 75 years ago, Silicon Valley was fruit orchards <laughs> and became this, you know, this kind, of, you know, kind of the envy of the, you know, the pride of America, the envy of the world. So these things rise and fall. And what's happening now in Detroit because of the work of Endeavor and a lot of other folks is it's rising up again. Right. And so we started there, then we went to Pittsburgh, and we've been, we've been to I think, 26, 27 cities, Nashville, and, and recently Albuquerque and Phoenix and Denver and Salt Lake and Omaha. I mean, these, these are great cities with great histories, but also I think great futures if we really support the entrepreneurs that are doing the breakout things, not just around software and apps, but how do you figure out new water technologies? You know, the, you know water is a real challenge increasingly. Oh, well, there you go. Water. Uh, and, and energy and transportation and food and agriculture. I mean, these are you know, the, what we eat and how we move around and how we stay healthy. And you know, these are pretty fundamental, you know, kind of central parts of, of our lives, central parts of, uh, of the society, and there's not enough focus on that. So one of the things that's great about Endeavor, and Linda talked about this earlier, is of course entrepreneurs need to focus on their company. And, you know, they have to make sure that works. But it's sort of like the Maslow hierarchy. There's a there's also a need, I think, uh, frankly, an obligation to not just focus on your company, but also focus on your community. And then if you really have success, not just focus on your company and community, but also on your country. And so how do you do what, everything you can to not just focus on your own particular enterprise, but how do you lift up your community, lift up your country in, in the process? So we have a lot of entrepreneurs here. And, and you know, given the success that you've had and the, and, the, and the arc of your journey, as you look back on, on, on what you've accomplished, there must have been stages where you were really happy with how things are going. There must have been stages when you thought you probably hit a wall and you were going to fail entirely. As you, as you think back, what were those lessons learned and what would you kind of tell entrepreneurs as, as they think about at, more at the beginning of their journey? Um, what would you share with them? Well, one, I met some, some of the Endeavor entrepreneurs be, before dinner. I think one of the things very important, and I think it's been lost a little bit in the last you know, decade, uh, is that perseverance really matters. That I think in, in, you know, revolutions often happen in evolutionary ways. And while occasionally there's an overnight success, and certainly Facebook or Snapchat, you know, there's, there's some examples of that, that uh, recently, far more often, like AOL, there are 10 year in the making overnight successes. We started in 1985, only 3% of people were online. Those 3% were online one hour a week. <laughs> so we said we want to get America online, get the world online, we, we, were, we were serious. It took us a decade before anybody knew or cared. You know, we went from zero to one million customers in, in the first decade, then from one million to 25 million in the second decade. It was hard, it was a struggle. There were a few times where it didn't look like we'd make it, but we persevered, so that's, that's one lesson. The second is partnership. You know, that, that there's a, you know African proverb that we, we love. If you wanna go quickly, you can go alone, but if you wanna go far, you must go together. If you're really gonna change the world in some of these areas we're talking about, energy and water and, and food and agriculture and so forth, it's gonna require partnerships. So don't just focus on what you're doing, focus on how you can connect to what other people are doing. And the final one, and entrepreneurs don't like to, to hear this, but it, I think it's gonna become more and more, you know, more and more important, is the role of policy. You know, the, the, the nature of some of these, these industries, these sectors that are up for grabs in this next wave, what I call the third wave of, of the internet, are things that are regulated. And it's mm -hmm. frustrating. And you've done some work in healthcare and many other sectors, healthcare, education, all these sectors, there's some regulation. There's a reason there's some regulations, and they vary by country, but there's going to be some regulations about food safety. There's going to be some regulations about medical device you know, efficacy. There's going to be some regulations about drones in the skies and driverless cars on the, on the roads. And so the entrepreneurs who really want to deal with, challenge some of the most important parts of our lives are going to need to understand that that policy aspect is important. So I think perseverance is a big deal. 
I think partnership is a big deal. I, I think uh, this issue of, of uh, you know, policy is, is a big deal. And that mentality, I think, is going to be more important in this, in this next wave. And that's why the work of Endeavor is so important. It's not just about what you're doing specifically. It's how, and I've talked to a number of entrepreneurs to, you know, tonight who said this. It's, it's how you have, be part of a broader network, learn from each other, and figure out how to challenge each other, how to inspire each other. You know, that's really what's going to you know, lift up this next generation of companies, this lift up these communities, and lift up the countries, lift up the world. So in, in the third wave, you talk a lot about the, the, the importance that government will, will play in, in the third wave as it rolls out. Um, w and without getting into the contentious uh, U.S. election, but the U U.S. has historically had the greatest separation between government and business. Most other countries, there's a much closer relationship for good or for ill, but how do you think for, for those of, of, the, of our entrepreneurs who are U.S.-based, have you thought about how entrepreneurs can play a role in policy? And, and then I guess I would reverse it and say, whoever gets elected, what should their agenda be with regard to entrepreneurship? Well, on the, on the first point, I think it's critically important that the entrepreneurs uh, take a real leadership role in trying to figure out ways to make sure that the future really is more inclusive and that the policymakers understand the complexities, the nuances of technology change and, and other kinds of things. There, there's a lot of entrepreneurs who just don't want to deal with that. They, they're, just, they're busy, it's frustrating to talk with those government people and deal with that regulation stuff. I, I, I understand that. Uh, but if you don't engage, it's, it, the, the rules of the road that are put in place are not going to be the right ones. It's going to require, in this third way, much more of a dialogue, a constructive engagement between the innovators and the policymakers. And I think that's important in the long run for your own business, but it's critically important if we're really going to be you know, successful in, in striking the right balance in, the, in, these, uh, in these new sectors. In terms of the, you know, the, the next president, I think it's continuing some of the, the work that's happened uh, more recently. How do you make sure every entrepreneur does have access to capital? Things like the Jobs Act, which legalized crowdfunding, created an on-ramp for IPOs is, is a start. There's other ways to make sure the capital flows more broadly to more entrepreneurs and uh, in more places. How do you get the regulations right in, in these sectors? How do you get the investment incentives right in these sectors? How do you change our immigration policy so you can start winning what's now a global battle for talent, which we are beginning to, you know, to lose? So there are a bunch of things that need to, need to happen to continue to, to build on this. I remind people, because Gene and I live in the, in the Washington, D.C. area, that 250 years ago, America itself was a startup. Right. It was just an idea and a pretty fragile idea. And it went from this fragile startup nation to the leader of the free world, in part because of the fact that the economy ended up being kind of the leading economy in the world. And that was not an accident. You know, we, this country led the way in the agriculture revolution, led the way in the industrial revolution, more recently led the way in the technology revolution. So we want to continue to be, lead the way and be the leader of the free world. We have to continue to, to focus on that, which is not to say that supporting, as Endeavor does, uh, entrepreneurs all over the world is not important. Of course it's important. Creating more jobs and, and hope and opportunity in the Middle East or in Africa, other places, are critically important. But we also need to make sure we don't get complacent we don't get cocky because you know, the, it, you know, sort of game on in terms of entrepreneurship is, is endeavor uh, ident is, is identified all over the country, all over the world. And how do you make sure this 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 next wave, this country continues to lead the way? Yeah, I think it, it's amazing to me because I read a book. Uh, you know, it's, it's people, particularly people in the U.S., don't have a long memory uh, generally, uh, and, and it's, it's a young country. Yes, yeah, a young country. It, it, it's true, but. So much of us, so many of us have grown up in a country that has been a world leader. But I read this book uh, about the Vanderbilt family and at the turn of the 20th century, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt died, I think in 1903, 1904. His estate was worth $5 million more than the United States Treasury. Um, and, and so really this country didn't uh, sort of assert itself until sort of after world, I mean, sort of post-depression into World War II, it, this was a very poor country. And I think we tend to take for granted the fact that we're always going to be right. a world leader and we're always going to be, and it was the entrepreneurs that, that built this country uh, up and we need the next generation uh, that now nobody I know supports entrepreneurship, is a greater role model for entrepreneurship, does more to promote entrepreneurship than, than you do. And 
That's why it's such an honor for all of us at Endeavor to be able to thank you and Jean for all that you do and to, and to tell you it's really a thrill and an honor for us to, to have you here, have you talk to us, and, uh, and allow us to honor you. Thank you all. It's been a great evening. Thank you for everything Endeavor's doing. Thank you, Edgar. Thank you, Steve. Thanks.